Heavenly Father, I thank you today that for those who maybe have been attacked by fear in their mind, I thank you that heavy burdens will be lifted. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are our helper today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we've been talking about the mind of Christ in a previous study. I talked about the renewing of the mind uh, using an expression uh, from Jesus Christ who spoke of all of our mind. And, and we talked about how the mind was darkened by sin. There was a limited understanding. The way Adam was thinking in the, in the Garden of Eden after he had sinned was different. He constructed his thoughts, his mental uh, sequencing of thought. It, it, it was changed. And, and then we talked about how there is, there is the mind of Christ, and we have that, but we should let it, uh, you know, be in us rather than choosing that darkened mindset. And so uh, today we're going to continue. We talked about also how the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain, you know, all these different parts of the brain are, are, are renewed by the help of the Holy Spirit. Today, I want to set the contrast from Scripture. The Bible talks about a number of different mindsets. The first one I want to introduce to you is the earthly mindset. Uh, this is sometimes called the earthy or the earthly. This is a mindset uh, that could be in the life of a believer. It, it's a mindset where you can believe in God. You can say, I'm a follower of Jesus. But, but you give little or no room for God to speak or to act or to be involved. And so let's look at the scripture right now. In, in Matthew 16, you have an example of this. It says there in verse 21, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must suffer many things and be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took him aside. Imagine that. Jesus is teaching something so crucially important. And now it says Simon Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Imagine the pride, the arrogance, rebuking Jesus. And he said, far be it from you, Lord, that this should happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. So somehow what Simon Peter was expressing here was right down devilish. He says, you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful. The, 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 way, the way you think, Simon Peter, it, it is not of the things of God, but the things of men. And Jesus said, this is offensive. Here's Simon Peter, well-intentioned. He's a follower of Jesus Christ. We could certainly say that Simon Peter, you know, had received a lot of teaching, but he's locked into this mindset of fear and insecurity, this mindset of everything is going to happen the way I figured it out in my mind. It, it, he, he just sees the natural circumstances. So when Jesus begins to introduce revelation, and say, there's a much deeper purpose here. I, the Son of Man must suffer, must die and, and rise again. You know, he, he says, well, that's not a part of how I saw it happening. It, James addresses this. He says in, and it's a very humanistic thinking, and James addresses it. He says, this wisdom, this humanistic thinking, this, uh, th this way of, of, of reaching conclusion, this earthly mindset descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. And, and, and so this is a, 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 a mindset that locks you in to simply thinking worldly can't see that God is involved in anything. This affects us. People say, well, I, I, I can't see myself getting involved. I can't see myself uh, becoming a person that is a, who is a channel uh, for, for the release of, of energy and, and, and giving and finances and planning. I don't see myself like that. It's like the, the way it's always been. That's how I see myself. I, I say there's actually two kinds of atheists. Well, we know the one kind of atheist. I call that the philosophical atheist. It's the one who, who's come to some conclusion that, that you know, 
God doesn't exist. That's one kind of atheist. And, and, and they, when I talk to atheists like that and, 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 and they want to have a conversation with me, I ask them, describe to me the God that you don't believe exists. And when they describe uh, the God, the view of God they have, I usually say, well, I don't believe in that God either because it is a God so far from Jesus Christ. And so we, we know that God is just like Jesus Christ. But, that, but that's one kind of atheist. Now, there's another kind of atheist. I, I, I suppose we could call this a person who is very secular in their approach. This is a person we would say that they are an atheist, not philosophically, oh, I believe God, I believe in God, I believe in God. But in the day-to-day -day life, it's just like God wasn't there. Uh, you know, the word secular means God's not there. It, 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 there's no expectation that, that God would do anything outside of our mindset. This is what Simon Peter is exhibiting. He says, well, I, I have it all figured out. This is the way it's going to happen. And when Jesus says, oh, there's something a lot bigger going on here, a lot bigger, but he, he can't comprehend it. He says, Jesus, I need to rebuke you now. And you see, I believe this earthy, this worldly mindset is something to really watch for today. You know, we have, and, and you're watching this now, and maybe years from now people will listen to this. Well, I'm, I'm speaking of this as we are coming, hopefully, towards the end of this pandemic. And, 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 and even this has been a great temptation. I mean, I, people ask me what I think about vaccine, and I, I say, well, you know, just do whatever your heart tells you to do. But, but uh, so, so I'm not having any great statement of that. Some preachers do, and I, I wish they wouldn't. But anyhow, uh, but, I, but I do notice this, this mindset, this earthly thinking creeping in. It's almost like God so loved the world that he sent a vaccine. God so loved the world that he sent medical experts. Now, we respect people who sincerely try to convey information, but I tell you, it's very easy to forget that Jesus Christ is a healer, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is still Jehovah Rophe, the Lord, my healer. And so I, I want to encourage you, and, and maybe this isn't just related to a pandemic. It could be many circumstances in life. I encourage you, we have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ sees that God speaks, God acts, God is involved today. Don't miss Pastor Peter's just released groundbreaking teaching, The Mind of Christ. During these six lessons, you will gain spiritual and practical insights, including how to discern and discard a destructive mindset, understanding the conscience and subconscious mind, how to renew all our mind, discerning between the carnal and spiritual mind, three considerations before the mind can be renewed, R-E-N-E-W, five aspects of a renewed mind, the power of a new imagination, the mind of Christ in relationships, finances, health, promotion, and family, freedom from a scarcity mindset, and much more. The Mind of Christ seminar is available now on CD or DVD, CD $29 and DVD $39, Shipping and handling included. Call now, 416-745-1820, or order online at peteryoungren.org slash shop. I mean, the, these teachings are all so practically helpful. In, in one of the sessions here, I go into different practical areas of our life and how does it work in practice? How is the mind of Christ applied in that situation? So go ahead and, and, and order this material and encourage your friends, encourage yourself. I love the one of the teachings is freedom from a, a scarcity mindset, which can grip us all. And it really stunts our development. It really hinders us from moving forward. So go ahead and order this. And uh, I, I think you will see that we have a terrific price. If you want it in DVDs, you can watch it with your friends or watch it by yourself. That's also available there. But we're going back now into the teaching and uh, don't miss a word of this. It's a carnal mindset. This is a mindset that has to do with uh, our, our, our pursuit of God, but this is the mindset that sees only our own effort, very self-centered, self-centered, self-seeking, self-smug, 
if you wish. And, and so let, let's, let's read about this. Those who live according to, their fle to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, set their thinking. But to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's what I put here on the screen behind me. To be spiritually minded, to have the mind of Christ is life and peace. Maybe you say, I, I feel like there's so much death around me. Uh, there's so much confusion. There's so much fear. So the key to overcome that is the mind of Christ, to be spiritually minded. Uh, now, the word carnal, fleshly, you know, we hear that expression, of course, is found much in the New Testament teaching, and it certainly can mean envy, it can mean lusts, sexual sins, covetousness, all of that. You know, I, I understand that, but I suggest that in this passage here in Romans chapter 8, if you take it in its context, it, 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 it is really talking about a self-reliance in our approach to God. Uh, you know, in, in, in Romans chapter 7, it talks about being married to a religious system. And, and that system is carnal. That is a system that says, how much can I do? How much can I pray? How much can I read the Bible? How much, how much dedication can I put forth? And it relies on that. The Bible calls it the arm of the flesh. In other words, what, what, what I can do. This is how, how I can impress God. So, so it, Romans 7 talks about how we can be married to that versus being, uh, and it's using an illustration. It's not talking about a marriage as we know it, but, but it's talking about being married, being joined together with Jesus Christ and what he's done. Look, look at Romans 1, uh, chapter 7, verse 1 starts out where Paul is teaching about this. And then we see that expression about being carnally minded versus spiritually minded in the light of the context. He says, I'm speaking to those who know the law, those of you who know the religious system that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the, and then he, then he compares marriage here. He uses an illustration. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband as long as he's alive. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law. So the illustration here is what happens when a husband dies. Now, we don't wish for any husband to die, but this is the illustration Paul is using. Then he says in verse 4, you also, so, so, the, so the husband who died is a picture of us. You also were put to death in regard to the law. That's in, in, in regard to the, to the religious system with all its prescriptions of rituals and requirements and ceremonial um, demands. He says, you, you, you died to that through the body of Christ. So when Christ's body died on the cross, you died to this religious system so that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. And the illustration Paul is giving here is that, that if you, and he talks really about it as a miserable marriage. He says at one time, speaks of himself, I was married to the religious system. I was married to the law, and the law was holy and pure and just. You know, imagine that being married to someone who is perfect. And Paul says the religious system was perfect. There was only one problem with it. I couldn't live up to it, and it didn't help me. Uh, the, the law says, don't do this. The law says, do this. That's what religious systems do, even today. And, and, and Paul says, I was so miserable because I had every intention to do right. And even though I just intended to do right, I found myself doing wrong. And then he says, the things I didn't want to do, I did. And the things I, 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 I wanted to do, I found myself not being able to do that. He says, well, what's the answer? What's the answer? Some people say, well, was, was Paul describing himself as he was a believer in Christ, or, or was he describing it? That, that's not really the issue. He's describing himself as being under a religious system. You can belong to a church. You can belong to a, 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 the Christian religion, if you wish, and, and you're still under this idea that I must live up to a standard in order for me to be acceptable uh, to God. And so here, Paul says the answer to this 
carnal mindset is to see what happened at the death of Christ. There was a double death, if you wish. When Jesus went to the cross, we died with him. So he said, Paul says, you died. You died to the old husband. And now you are risen with Christ to be married to another. So, so, so we died to ourself, our sins, everything was buried, put away. But also the religious system with his handwritings of requirements. That's how Paul says it in the book of Colossians. It, it was nailed to the cross. And so what does it mean to be carnally minded? It means to still live in this, you know, am I good enough? Do I measure up? You still kind of have your car parked in Romans chapter 7. Oh, I try so hard, but the things I tried to do, I can't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. You live in that, oh, I'm the most wretched of people, Paul, Paul says. Or you can pull your car out of that parking spot in Romans 7 and you drive over to Romans chapter 8 where it says, I see myself identified in Jesus Christ and there's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And said, this is where I'm going to park my car. I'm not going to live in Romans 7, which is the carnal description of the carnal thinking. I'm going to live in Romans chapter 8, which is the spirit spiritual mind, the mind of Christ, which is life. So you realize, I want to live holy. I want to, I want to do what, what, what is good to do and what is righteous to do. But if I fail, I still have a friend. I have an advocate that is closer than a brother, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he speaks on my behalf. That gives you peace, gives you life. And, and and, 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 and so there's been some kind of bombardment on people's minds. And they say, I, I, don't, I don't see it. I, I, I'm trying so hard. I want to tell you, life for you is in Christ Jesus. It's another kind of mindset, the proud mindset. That means to be arrogant, puffed up, you know, always thinking you're the greatest and everybody else is a little bit below you. The Bible says knowledge puffs up. That could be one reason. Here's how Paul says it in Romans 12. I say through the grace given to me, to everyone, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. This is to do with the thinking, how we think, how we construct thoughts. That's what the mind is all about. It's not just a thought coming and going. It's how we construct a thought. Don't think more highly than you ought to think, but think soberly. As God has dealt to each person the measure of faith. And, and so this, 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 this prideful mindset is it's, uh, it's always like you got an inside track and need to give your opinion on everything and always feel like, like I, I'm, I'm the good one. I'm the best spouse. I'm the best parent. I'm the best. I, I know how to do everything. You know, that can come into a church. I've seen that affect churches, and it, and it can look really good for a while, like, like our church is the best. We have the greatest insight. We, we're better than other churches. You don't say that openly, but it kind of comes through. And, and, you know, that always leads to death and disappointment. It's an arrogant mindset. Sometimes you hear it when people are praying. You know, people say, I remember one of the ladies, she said, pray for my husband. And I said, all right. Then he said, well, I'll start. And they said, oh, God, you know what a rascal so-and-so is, and, and you know what he has done, and you know he's not reliable. You know, she wasn't praying. She was gossiping to God. And that's an arrogant mindset. Said, Paul says, don't, don't be arrogant. Don't, don't be proud like that. Don't be judgmental. Don't be suspicious of everybody else. But rather what he says, Here, here's the proper thinking. Think of yourself and others in terms of that God has given to each person the measure of faith. So you say, I, I don't, you, you know, I'm not proud in myself. I'm not proud of Peter Youngren, but I am proud in Christ. I'm glad that Christ has come to live in me. I'm glad that Christ is getting bigger and bigger inside of me. Oh, that, that's so important. He's, I'm growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's something, but that's not being proud in me. I'm just proud in my God that God would be so good. He would give me a measure of faith. You know, throughout my life as a preacher, 
from time to time people have been bragging, saying nice things, sometimes in public to me and sometimes privately. Oh, Peter, you're such a man of faith. Such a man of faith. I don't ever say that I'm, I'm a man of faith. But see, people say, oh, you're such a man of faith. As if that was something to brag about. I feel instead I'm weak, but when I'm weak, I'm strong. But I do believe that Jesus gave me a revelation about this, that I have the faith of the Son of God. So if I think anything, I never think that Peter Youngren, through whatever spiritual exercises, worked himself to a place where he has a lot of faith. No, I think that, that God revealed to me that he has given me the measure of faith, the same kind of faith that Jesus Christ had. And, and on the basis of that, I can go forward. I can take steps. I don't have to become discouraged and, 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 and downcast and feel like there's no hope even during a time of pandemic. I can say, we're going forward. We're taking steps of faith because God has given me I'm at the measure of it, you think the same way. That's sober thinking. Well, let's take a hold of that right now. God gives you faith. Faith is not of yourself. It is a gift of God. And maybe you are somehow sensing or emotionally you're at a place where you say, well, my faith is just dissipated. It's, it's like it's gone. It's, it's it just disappeared. But Jesus Christ gives you faith. And as I zeroed in on that right now, that is not proud. That is not arrogant to say that God has given me the measure of faith which you received as a gift from Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you right now for the gift of faith that is in operation. I believe as you're watching me right now, there's a gift of faith in operation where you are. It's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So maybe... There's a situation that looks so dark and so despairing and so impossible, but God, by His Spirit, is giving you faith to see it in a different light. There are some of you who have struggled to receive something from God. Often it can be healing, but it can be many other things, and it seemed like you know, between feeling the pain and hearing the doctor's report and then trying to listen to, uh, you know, messages about Jesus Christ and, and, and what's written in, 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 in the Bible, promises of God, it seems you just tossed back and forth. And I understand that it's kind of like you're like that ship out in the ocean being tossed in the storm, but it cuts right through that. Jesus gives you faith. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ right now, receive from God. Just, just exercise it a little bit. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving me faith. Thank you for helping me to receive right now. And, and, and as faith comes in your heart, then take a step of faith. Take, take a step and say, I, I, I'm, I'm going to do something that I thought I couldn't do. You'd be amazed how God is at work in you. You say, well, I don't even know if I'm a believer. I just watch this sometimes. Jesus Christ is right there with you. That You don't have to qualify yourself. Just go ahead and receive. Let me hear from you what God has done. Call the Grace Prayer Center. We want to hear from you. We want to rejoice with you. We want to pray with you also. Now, let's not forget our great task. Watch this. It's a ministry with a heart as big as the whole wide world. It started in a small missions chapel. That very first service, I just had one goal in mind, that somebody would receive Christ as their Savior. I hoped to preach for 10 minutes, but I didn't last that long. I didn't have enough to say. But at the end of it, two people came to the Lord. The vision only grew stronger. And I saw a vision, and, and it, it changed my life. It put such a passion in me to touch the world with the gospel. In a way, I became like an untamed tiger. I just wanted to break out of the whatever confinement I was in. And sometimes that confinement was within the, the Christian church where we were so much about ourselves and reach out to those who had never known Jesus. That passion has continued unabated for 40 years with some of the largest gospel outreaches ever, especially in countries that are normally considered impossible. Just like the Apostle Paul, 
Peter seeks to gain a foothold for the gospel by first meeting with political and religious leaders. Amazingly, God opens the heart of prime ministers, presidents, governors, and leaders of various religions. Friendship festivals are just that, events often held in large stadiums where the good news of Jesus Christ is presented uncompromisingly and yet in an attitude of respect and friendship towards all. Gospel Revolution seminars have impacted 356,000 leaders and counting, an extensive training that reintroduced pastors, bishops, and leaders to the simplicity and yet profound power of Christ's gospel. Through media, believers are enlisted in the cause of Christ, and many hear the gospel often for the very first time. Newborn believers, more than 16 million over the last 25 years, need nurturing. And so the teaching booklet, Salvation, God's Gift to You, becomes their first introduction to the Christian faith. All this, plus ongoing ministry in Israel, Bible schools in different parts of the world, long-term missionaries, and much more, is made possible by partners. Partnership is more than giving. It is people who stand shoulder to shoulder for the gospel. The VIP family are the monthly partners who form the backbone of the ministry. Because of the VIP family, we're able to say yes to the challenges that come to us. Because we know we have people who stand shoulder to shoulder uh, with this ministry. And they believe like I believe that and everyone has a basic human right to hear the gospel. Make your life count for souls, for eternity, for the gospel. Call now, 416-745-1820, or give online at peteryoungren.org. I'm so grateful to everyone who believes, and I believe it's according to Jesus, that this is the, of paramount importance that every person has, has a right. It's a basic human right to hear and to receive the gospel. And so thank you for everybody who is joining us to become a monthly partner. We call that our VIP family, or please give whatever gift you can right now. You see all the information on the screen there. We're going to continue talking about the mind of Christ. Remember, you have the mind of Christ. Use it. You are loved. Thank you. Your participation makes this global gospel ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the gospel to those who have never heard it, call 416-745-1820. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at P.O. Box 62039, RPO, Victoria Terrace, North York, Ontario, M4A2W1 or P.O. Box 433, Winchester, Kentucky, 40392-9800. Together, let's give everyone a chance to know God's love in Jesus Christ.